yesterday we had a look at the first principles of permaculture, the principles of original permaculture, where what we're doing is making a fairly direct imitation of nature, you know, with the diversity that you find in a natural ecosystem and the structure and so on and so forth. Now, <clears throat> that was the first stage of permaculture, but then after a while, they looked at this model of the natural ecosystem and asked a very fundamental question, which is why? Is it so much more productive than the natural ecosystem and, uh, sorry, so much more productive than the cultivated ecosystem and uh, so self-reliant, meeting all of its own needs? And of course the answer lies in diversity, but it's not just random diversity. You could get a thousand randomly assorted plant and animal species and put them down in one place and you wouldn't get an ecosystem. You'd get a mess, because they wouldn't relate to each other. What actually makes the ecosystem work is a high diversity of beneficial relationships between the different components. So, for example, different plants specialise at extracting different minerals from the soil. And when the plant dies, or when its leaves fall, those minerals become available to other plants. But this doesn't happen directly, it happens through the action of bacteria and fungi. Um, and also there's the relationships between the uh, plants and animals. For example, the pollinating insects and the flowering plants, where one gets its food needs met and the other gets its reproductive needs met. And so on and so on and so on. And the more you look at a natural ecosystem, the more you can see that there's just an absolute myriad of different interactions, and the vast majority of them are beneficial. You know, in our culture, competition is very much emphasised. We talk about the law of the jungle and so forth, and so, yeah, certainly competition does go on, and it's a very important interaction. Um, but none of that could work if it wasn't for the beneficial interactions that, that keep things going. There are far more of them. Um, so, oh, let's use black for this. Now, if we're trying to produce a system which is full of beneficial interactions, we need to place different things in a position where these beneficial interactions can take place. And if I can take an example, say take a house and a greenhouse. Now, if that greenhouse is on its own, it loses energy. As soon as the temperature falls at night time, it loses heat in every direction and then again in, in, in the daytime it warms up again and actually that lost, that lost heat is wasted heat <clears throat> and of course the greenhouse is colder at night time but if you put that house and that greenhouse together making it into a conservatory as we say in Britain uh, what you get is a beneficial interaction whereby at least some of the lost heat at night time is absorbed by the wall of the house stored there, some of it will help to warm up the house, certainly a lot of the heat collected by the conservatory, if it's well designed, <coughs> can help to heat the house and also some of that heat will be there in the structure and it will help to heat the, the greenhouse through the night and so your greenhouse can stay frost free without the use of any fossil fuel heating. So getting this a web of beneficial interactions and a little bit later on this morning I'll show you some more that you can have between a house and a conservatory. So it's just simply the act of putting those two structures together judiciously, you know, thoughtfully, you start getting beneficial interactions. 
and it doesn't look like a natural ecosystem but it shares with the natural ecosystem this characteristic of beneficial interactions. So where we put things relative to each other is very important. hope my handwriting is legible at this <laughs> strange angle, doing it all sitting down. Can you read that okay? Yeah. Perfect. Good. And that is why permaculture becomes a matter of design. Of functional design. And you saw this yesterday in Carrie's presentation about the permaculture chicken. You know, those interactions that she was describing there only happen if those different elements the chickens, the garden, the orchard and so forth, if they're placed in such a position that those interactions can take place. And that is why permaculture is a matter of design. That is why this course that we're on is called the Permaculture Design Course and the central activity is a series of design exercises that uh, you will be doing through, a, uh, through the course culminating on the last day, pinnacle of glory. Um, right, so, we have original permaculture, and now we have design permaculture. So, I will show you a little bit about design permaculture. Now, I don't propose to cover everything about design permaculture. What I want to do is to home in on to... Uh, what I think is the most useful aspect of design permaculture, and that is what David Holmgren, remember he's one of the two founders of permaculture, what he calls the key planning tools. And this is uh, like a, a mental toolkit of four concepts which can be used to design productive landscapes. And they are, don't, don't worry if you don't catch them now, because I'll be describing each one individually. But uh, it's zone, sector, network, and elevation. Okay. Uh -huh.